on my way back, I was like, maybe I will go to the same room to go like see everyone. And if there's not something like for my breakfast, excuse me, but yeah. how was the second half of the day? Pretty good. You know, it just uh, the weather's great. I, I had a little bit of a work emergency, like proper emergency, and I know mm -hmm. when people say that they're so busy. Yeah. So I missed quite a bit because I was out the hallway, like trying to yeah. put out fires. Um, but the weather's awesome. Yeah. Well.
All right. Oops. 
All right, welcome everyone. Just making sure I've got my cheat sheet here. Welcome everyone. My name is Lara Villalmat, she and hers. I'm the head of outreach and community experience here at the Framingham Public Library. And we are so thrilled to welcome you tonight to tonight's <coughs> lifelong learning lecture with Anna Tucker from the Framingham History Center. Um, a few brief announcements before we get started here. Um, please take this opportunity to go ahead and silence your cell phones. If you've got any ringers, alarms, anything like that turned on, go ahead and turn those off for us. The library is open until 9, so if you'd like to grab a book on your way out, we'd love to have you do that. And then, of course, we have our evaluation sheets on the back table there. We would love to hear from you what you thought about tonight's event. If you have any ideas for future events, or if you're not on our mailing list, we would love to have you join us. Uh, we are the public library, so the only thing that we will ever send you is more information about great free library programs. Um, thank you so much to our partners on this program, the Framingham State University, and their winter intercession is coming up soon, so keep your eyes on their website and ours for more details upcoming for that as well. Um, and of course, thank you so much to our sponsors, the Joseph L. and Ray L. Frund Foundation, courtesy of Elizabeth Verdeller, and the Friends of the Framingham Public Library, without whom series like this would be possible. And with that, I would also like to invite you to our final lecture next week, featuring Dr. David Smales. He will be talking about the, oop, let me get the exact title here, The New American Presidency, the uni Unitary Executive. So uh, if you would like to hear a little bit more about that, both online and here in person, if you come in person, we have coffee and cookies. Um, if you're at home, please kick back, enjoy your favorite beverage, and we would like to welcome Anna Tucker. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me in the room so far? Excellent. Um, and welcome also to those of you joining us online. I'm excited to talk about uh, one of my favorite subjects, um, which is the story of immigration and global migration. Um, but before I get started, uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention is, is how crucial this story is to the story of Framingham. Um, when I initially heard about the Framingham History Center, when I joined as the new executive director of the Framingham History Center last year, um, I, of course, searched Framingham. And I'd heard of the Framingham Heart Study. It's usually the first thing that people know of. Um, and in fact, since I've moved here, I bring up Framingham. And almost everyone says, have you heard of the Framingham Heart study? And I said, yes, I have. Um, but one of the first things I looked up about Framingham is a little bit more about the city itself, the history, um, the, the um, sort of the demographics. And I saw that nearly one in three um, people who are here in Framingham were actually born outside the United States. And I thought first, wow, there must be really good food here. Um, and that is accurate. Um, and I immediately thought, what an incredible opportunity to talk about a city that has a diversity of background, a diversity of history. And how do we talk about that as a community? How do we explore all the different threads that come together to make up the story of who we are as a community? And that's really what I want to talk about tonight is what is the story of Framingham through the the lens of immigration? How has this story sort of been built over time? And, and where do we continue with this story itself? And so I wanted to give a, a very brief overview about tonight's discussion. So it's split up into three parts. So the first part is going to be about um, the, some of the major turning points in immigration history in Framingham. And it's both a global discussion, but also a, a very local discussion as well. That will take us to about the 1960s or 1970s. I'm gonna you know, dip a little bit into the 1980s, but for the second part, we're going to talk about the exhibition that we're opening at Framingham History Center in January of 2024. And this is called Framingham's Collective Journeys, the Stories of Immigration from 1960 to Present. That's where I'll start talking a little bit more about immigration today and how it shaped the, the landscape of Framingham itself. 
And then the final third is actually going to be a discussion. So spoiler, I'm sorry if you are coming here for a lecture, you kick back and relax, that might not necessarily happen. Um, there was a very real reason why we wanted to hold this discussion before the exhibition opened, and that's because we want your views, we want your stories, we want your, ex uh, your perspectives as well. So the last third of the talk, I really want to be a discussion where we can talk a little bit more about your histories um, and the way that they interweave throughout uh, the, the story of Framingham itself. And Anna, if I could just jump in really quickly and encourage the folks online to stay with us through the discussion. I forgot to mention in my introduction, but we'll be passing the microphone around the room to all of you when you're sharing your thoughts. And then also, if you would like to participate online, you can post your thoughts in the chat on YouTube, and we'll be happy to read those out to Anna. So please stay with us for the discussion. It's where we got the technology to all participate. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lara. And um, so, uh, and one of the things that I did want to point out before we start talking about the story of migration um, is, is sometimes a, a misnomer. Many people say, oh, we all have a story of immigration or we're all here via immigration. And that's something that is not necessarily accurate. Um, when we talk about immigration, we also need to talk about the populations that were here and greatly affected by immigration, um, including indigenous and first peoples. Um, so what I have up on the screen right now is um, actually one of the oldest uh, uh, documents that we have at the Framingham History Center, which is a land deed between John Stone, one of the earliest uh, English settlers, and five Nipmuc men, five indigenous men. And it, it speaks about a location that's roughly in what is present day Saxonville today. And it's a land deed. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to point out is it is in English. Um, it's actually very challenging to read. Of course, it was probably a little bit easier back then. Um, but the five Nipmuc men who were um, in many ways heavily pressured to sign this did not read or write English. Um, you can actually see the marks next to their names on the right hand side. Um, and they, were, they did not sign their names um, because they did not read and write uh, in English. So this was a highly inequitable document. It really speaks um, to the tragedy and the inequity um, that took place on this region. Um, so when we talk about immigration, we have to acknowledge the fact that indigenous peoples um, were here, land was taken um, from them. The other thing that we have to acknowledge are the enslaved individuals who were forced here. Um, immigration, a lot of times there are narratives of choice, of um, going, moving for a better life. Um, and as we talk about immigration, we also have to talk, talk about the forceful enslavement of individuals, families, and communities who were forced here as well. So when we talk about the story of immigration, we do that with that context in place as well. Um, so I did want to start the discussion tonight um, with a little bit about that. Um, now, uh, for those of you who are in the room tonight, do you mind raising your hand if you've been to the Framingham History Center before? Okay, so for those of you who are online, I actually, I'm not just saying this because I'm the director. There are a fair number of people who raise their hands, which is great to um, see, but just as a little bit of an overview, um, so we're an independent nonprofit, um, and we're actually celebrating our 135th birthday this year. Um, so we were founded in 1888, and our entire focus is building community um, through the preservation and sharing of Framingham's past and present. Um, and we do that through exhibitions, we do it through public programming. Um, we do it through the preservation of our 10,000 piece artifact collection, which we have a, a collection committee member here in the audience tonight, um, as well as the preservation of the three buildings that you see on your screen. Um, on the left hand side is the academy, um, where uh, the majority of our 10,000 piece artifact collection is housed. On the far right, you see Village Hall in the Common, which is built in 1834 as Framingham's first town hall and is now the uh, site of many um, events. Uh, and then in the center, you see Edgel Memorial Library, which was built in 1872 for two purposes. One, it was the first freestanding library um, in Framingham, so it was great when I was um, getting my ways up to drive here. I was going from one library to the other library. But the second purpose of it um, was there was also a memorial to Union soldiers from Framingham. Um, so the three buildings themselves, as I like to say, they're our largest artifacts. Um, it is actually going to be in the center building that you see there, Edgel Memorial Library, that Collective Journeys is going to open um, in January of 2024. 
Okay, so now let's jump into the first section or segment of this evening, which is an overview, um, very, very brief, as you can see, um, history of immigration in America with an emphasis on immigration um, to Framingham. So um, for my background, I've been in the museum field for about 15 years now, um, and much of my background, including um, graduate studies, is in immigration history, specifically Jewish immigration history. But I've always been interested and fascinated by the movements, the push-pull factors, um, everything that sort of transpires during this journey of immigration. And even more importantly, the stories that we tell ourselves about that immigrant story um, through the years and through time. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that uh, as a human species, we have a really long history of migration. Um, I'm not going to go too, too far back, but as hunter-gatherer species, um, we moved around, we migrated, um, we moved from space to space. So a lot of times we talk about um, immigration as somewhat of a contemporary phenomenon, and it's contemporary in the fact that it's largely been defined by the rise of the nation state, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but in, in in many ways, it's sort of embedded in who we are. Um, it's about movement, it's about new horizons, it's about changing scenery, and for a variety of different reasons. Some of them positive and some of them um, not positive as well. So when we talk about immigration, this is something um, that, that has a very long history in who we are. So one of the things I wanted to start out with is sort of mapping immigration and how it actually shows us the way that the idea of nation or the nation state changes over time. Um, so can I ask just by a show of hands if you would like to share, um, how many of you had family members who immigrated to um, the United States before the 1890s or 1900s? Raise your hand. All right, a fair number of people in the background had family members who immigrated here. Oftentimes our families are sort of split in branches. I have some family members who immigrated before the 1890s, some after as well. Um, and one of the most fascinating things when we talk about immigration is in a lot of ways, um, the idea of immigration, naturalization, um, citizenship, it was kind of the Wild West um, in America um, up until the late-ish 1800s. Um, so through the late 1700s, 1700s into the 1800s, there was something called old law certificates, um, which means it was a really, you know, to put it academically, loosey-goosey when it came to who actually decided who was a, a, a naturalized or a citizen of the United States. Um, so it wasn't even until uh, 1875 that the Supreme Court decided that it was a federal responsibility um, to, to track or regulate immigration. So up until 1875, it wasn't even considered a federal responsibility. Sometimes it fell to states, um, sometimes it fell to random counties here and there. Um, but what you see is in the 1880s, what do we start seeing? So we, in the, yep, exactly. So in the audience, we see people escaping from bad situations. Absolutely. You see a big uptick in immigration in the 1880s, which when we explore the Framingham history, we'll dig into a little, a lot more. So you see many, many people in the millions starting to immigrate in the 1880s. So what happens is the United States at the time decided, okay, now we need to start shaping laws. So this is the first hint that you sort of see that immigration and laws are shaping each other as trends over time. So in the 1880s, you see an increase in immigration. One of the um, most uh, exclusionary acts that was passed was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, of which I think many of you know. Um, it was a drastic, almost exclusive, virtually exclusive um, exclusion of Chinese uh, immigrants to America. Um, and you see there was an uptick um, in a lot of Chinese immigrants, especially while the railroads were being built. Um, there was a lot of anti-immigrant discussion Discussion around the Chinese immigrants who are coming. Nativist groups um, were rallying um, and trying to really clamp down on immigration. Um, and so the Chinese Exclusion Act was enacted in 1882 and lasted almost a century, really up until, until World War II. Um, in the same year, the General Immigration Act of 1882 was passed. And this was one of the first, um, along with the Exclusion Act, regulatory acts. So it actually um, levied a head tax of 50 cents on every person 
person who is um, who is uh, immigrating, and then they also initiated a block. So the block were on certain individuals, and they were, um, and I apologize, some of the, this language um, is inflammatory. They were called um, idiots, lunatics, convicts, and persons likely to become a public charge. So you see in the 1880s, there's this restriction that's starting to come into place, and you can see some of the fears, the, the nativist fears um, around the, the concern of immigration. Now, the Immigration Act of 1891 finally instituted an office for the superintendent of immigration um, in the Treasury Department. Um, at this point, the federal government uh, assumed direct control of the inspections of individuals who are immigrating. Um, and one of the, th the things that I should point at this point, uh, point out uh, at this point that no polygamists were actually allowed into the, the United States. So if you were a polygamist, Tough luck for you. Officially, by 1891, uh, you were not allowed to enter. Um, now, all of this, again, uh, was really looking at the points of entry. So Ellis Island, which at one point had 70% of the people who were entering into the United States, um, these were really sort of ports of entry. And you notice I'm not talking as much about the, um, the naturalization certificates or the citizenship um, certificates. It was not until the Basic Naturalization Act of 1906 um, that these naturalization certificates were actually required to be sent um, to Washington, D.C. Before that time, a lot of these documents were actually kept by uh, local counties, um, sometimes by states, and they came in all different forms and sizes. Um, so some of them, and, and we, I, I'm actually am interested to see if the Framingham History Center has any, we, we actually might, um, but at some of my previous collections, they would come in all different shapes and sizes, they would ask different questions, some of them were completed, some of them were incomplete, so it wasn't even until 1906 that these documents um, uh, assuring citizenship or this idea of naturalization um, came into effect. And that's really late when you think about the timeline. You think about the millions of people um, where this, this is part of the narrative. Um, we're actually trying to navigate this quickly shifting and changing system. Um, now, how many of you have heard of the Immigration Act of 1924 in the audience? Raise your hand. A little bit here and there, you might you know, remember it from um, high school or college classes. This was really one of the biggest turning points in immigration history in the United States. And the reason why is because it was the first time um, that the United States enacted a National Origins Act, which means there was a restriction on people based off of the country that they were moving from. Um, so the quota was very strict. Um, it provided immigration visas to 2% roughly of the total number of people um, who had immigrated from each country. The, the real challenge and the intentional um, exclusion was that it was based off of a census um, where the vast majority of these individuals came from Western Europe. So if you take 2% of that population, suddenly you see massive restriction of people who are coming from Eastern Europe, include, including many Jewish immigrants, um, all parts of Africa. Asia, of course, had a, a continued exclusion entirely. Um, but it's at this point that the 1924 Act um, really defines this anti-immigrant uh, movement that was taking place in the United States at the time. Um, so and let me just ask you, what were some of the things that that uh, 1924 directly followed? What were some of the big events? World War I. World War I. Yeah, World War I, when you see this complete decimation of populations, an upturning of uh, orders um, in terms of nationalities, movements of lines and borders. There was a lot of fear that was taking place. Um, and one of the responses to that was this increase in this anti-immigrant sentiment. And this is a theme that you're going to see throughout the talk of immigration. When there are economic upheavals, when there is fear and concern, a lot of time the most vulnerable populations are the ones um, who are most affected. They are the ones who are often blamed um, and, and scapegoated. And I see a, a hand in the audience. Excellent, excellent, excellent point. Um, so we had a note from the audience that the flu epidemic took place um, in 1918 as well in that, in that time period. I mean, very interestingly, only about 20, 30 years before, people were starting to be turned away at Ellis Island for being considered, uh, considered quote unquote, diseased. Um, so there was a lot of concern about the health of the body at this time period. Um, so you're absolutely right. That is one of the big, big components that led into some of this anti-immigration 
inflation sentiment. And there's one more thing that we'll actually talk about um, in just a few minutes when we discuss uh, Italy um, in particular in Framingham that led to some of these, these really tightening um, of the restrictions. So what the Immigration Act of 1924 did is it, it capped overall immigration by a significant percent. Um, the numbers vary a little bit from, from place to place. It's estimated that overall immigration at this time period was around 150,000 per year from the entire world. Um, and that's, that's significant in comparison to how many millions had come um, in the eras beforehand. So roughly um, the foreign born population is estimated to have almost basically doubled from 6.7 million up to over 14 million between 1880 and 1930. So you can see this basically this, this big squeeze happening with the Immigration Act of 1924. I do want to point out one thing that when we do talk about um, the, the immigration closures um, is also the idea that there was a lot of creativity that was involved in this and enacted on the part of immigrants. Um, interestingly, from the 1930s, 1940s or so, um, when many people uh, talked about the concept of illegal immigration, the number one group that often came to mind was Jewish immigration, um, something that sometimes is, is a point of surprise um, for people today. Libby Garland wrote a fantastic book called After They Close the Gates that specifically talks about immigration um, during this time, this time period specifically. So I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit in time to talk about, um, in 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. I'm not going to dwell on it um, too much, uh, apart from saying this was pretty transformational. It removed the national origins requirement, which means it was not restricted based off of the country of origin. Um, and you actually see a, a jump in annual immigration, um, not surprisingly, to around half a million people, so around 500,000 people after that. Um, only about 20 to 30 percent of whom came from Europe. So 1965, we see a big shift, and actually that's something we're going to talk about a little bit when we speak about um, Framingham itself. Um, so when we talk about uh, uh, immigration, it's important to also discuss the push-pull factors of immigration. Um, can I just ask from the audience, what are some of the reasons why people would want to immigrate? So we already heard tragic circumstances. So what, what would some of those circumstances be? What, what was that? Land, yep. So opportunity, ability, even to own land. Um, if you were re restricted from owning land um, based off of your background, um, America offered that opportunity, right? What else? Poverty, yes. Uh, the United States definitely had um, this this veneer, sort of this idea that you could actually build something there. You had an opportunity um, to to grow or create a business. Absolutely. What else? Yeah, physical safety, that was a big one. You, you often see um, these waves of immigration happening when there are pol there's political turmoil, um, where there are pogroms or violent attacks after um, uh, specific people groups. So just safety, sheer safety. Um, what else? Religion, yep. So um, freedom to uh, celebrate or to, um, to observe your religion was another one. Um, so one of the things I just want to point out here is that uh, there are a lot of um, these examples of positive and negative. And when we talk about it, it's often two sides of the same coin. Um, so uh, poverty um, is one side of the opportunity to establish your own business. Um, you know, fear or um, pogrom is the other side of a place to live in safety and in peace. Um, so whenever we, we talk about push-pull factors, I think it's important to think about that coin, but also to think about it's never one thing. It's always a combination often of factors um, because it also influences where an individual would go. Um, so if you were fleeing from a crisis, a, a trauma, you would often try to go to a place um, that, first of all, would allow you in, um, and often that might have had some sort of establishment. You had a cousin there. You had an uncle there. Um, or you might have heard about it in the newspaper. Um, very interestingly enough, the United States was actually advertised in newspapers um, overseas as being this, this, this golden place um, where you could establish, establish yourself as well. 
And um, so one of the, the um, actually before we go there, um, I did want to mention just very briefly um, that when you look at immigration, you can see all of these shifts over time. So you look at immigration, you suddenly see the shape of economics, you see the shape of business, you see, see the shape of politics. Um, so when we go through these very Framingham specific um, discussions up ahead, you'll really see how it's not just a discussion of Framingham or uh, immigration. It's really a discussion of framing him as a whole and the way that things changed over time. So um, one of the things that I'm just checking uh, time here, I don't want to run too long um, with, with what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, I did want to point out this uh, photo on the screen. This is a photo of what was called the Galveston Movement. Has anyone heard of the Galveston Movement by any chance? Um, so this was a movement between 1907 and 1914. Um, and during this time period, there were very high anti-immigration um, protests going on. Um, and, and again, this was right in the middle after that 1880s wave of immigration immigration came in. Um, there was a lot of anti-Semitic movement that took place. Um, and so there were discussions led by Jacob Schiff about what do you do to alleviate some of this pressure. So this whole plan was developed that said, you know what, everyone's looking at Ellis Island. What if we move Jewish immigration from Ellis Island through Galveston, Texas, where no one is looking? Um, and that's exactly what took place between 1907 and 1910. Um, roughly 10,000 Jewish immigrants who were fleeing really challenging environments and pogroms um, actually immigrated through Galveston, Texas, um, and then went on to, to different um, areas within the United States. This photo is the first photo taken of the first ship of um, Jewish refugees or immigrants um, on a Galveston ship. The reason why I wanted to pull this up, uh, I didn't realize it. I was actually at a conference with the, where this image was shown after I came here to the Framingham History Center. And you'll notice on their lapels, they actually have Denison tags. Um, so that was a little connection I did not necessarily expect to see there. Okay, so how did Framingham get this story of being a welcoming place, being a place um, where uh, basically immigrants could come, refugees could come, um, where they would be welcomed um, with open arms? And so I want to go through um, some specific Framingham stories to look at what might be behind that. So one of the first things I wanted to bring up um, was the, the story of refuge that many of you know here, I'm sure, the story of Sarah Clay. So raise your hand if you, you know Sarah Clay. Okay, so a few um, individuals individuals in the audience here. So Sarah Clay's, um, and I'll, I'll be brief, um, it, during the 1690s in Salem, um, she was caught up uh, in the accusations that were going around about witchcraft. So um, her sister was uh, was um, accused. Um, supposedly during one of the church services, um, uh, Sarah Clay's left um, the meeting house, um, sort of the door slammed behind her, and then she became accused as well. Um, through a series of um, curious and maybe somewhat gray shrouded events, um, she uh, managed to escape jail after a long period of time um, and came to the area uh, that would become Framingham. And she actually settled in Salem's, the, roughly the region of Salem's End Road, which gained the name Salem End. Um, so it's this idea that Framingham in this area was a place of refuge. You could escape things like the Salem witch trials, and this would be a haven. Um, and this is actually a story that I've heard several times around this narrative of, oh, our, our narrative started with um, Sarah Clay is fleeing and finding refuge in Framingham, which is, again, I think part of this um, intentional story that you see. So one of the things I wanted to bring up when we start talking about the story of immigration is how crucial um, the development of economics in the United States were for this. Um, and one of the most uh, significant changes in many, many towns, including Framingham, um, was actually the establishment of railroads. Um, now, let me ask in the audience, why do you think railroads, or what would railroads have to do with immigration at all? I love that. Yes, you can get someplace. Or you could just get someplace. Yeah, what else? Also the people who built the railroads. Exactly. The people who built the railroads. Yep. Easy delivery of goods. So these are actually the three pillars. I'm very impressed. I, I promised to the people online I didn't plant these answers here. Um, so absolutely, the, the, the establishment of railroads um, was central to both getting people to an area, but the building of an infrastructure um, that made it a place that, that was very respect receptive to immigration. Um, so what you see here is a circa 1880s um, shot of a South Framingham station. It was moved a little bit later. Um, but really, the, the, the start 
start of it was the Boston and Worcester Railroad, um, which came through. The initial right of way was for two and a half miles, um, and it was actually away from uh, Center Common, which is a story for another day. But the first train rolled into the station on September 20th, 1834, and it was called the Yankee, um, of all things. And so it actually supposedly looked like a series of stagecoaches. Um, but just by the next year, the tracks were actually completed so that there was a way between Boston and Worcester. So Framingham is in the center place, and, and it has been a very central place for a long time. Stagecoaches, of course, indigenous communities, this was a very active place of trade and commerce um, for many, many communities that have lived here. Um, but what you see uh, is that when, when the train tracks were built, suddenly the ability to bring goods to these areas was established. You start seeing um, the way that the natural landscape worked with the railroad. So there were establishments of factories. And what do you need for factories? You need people. And and for many of the factory owners, um, they wanted to find as cheap labor as possible. When you look for cheap labor, you look for people um, who are often new to an area, meaning immigrants. So as you see these factories being built, including the straw hat factories, um, the rubber factories, uh, Denison, you see this influx of immigration to Framingham to support that growing infrastructure. So when we talk about the growth of Framingham, we have to talk about the role of, fra of immigrants in that building um, of Framingham. Framingham itself. So one of the, the earliest larger waves of immigrants um, to Framingham, um, which, which nation or community um, do you think they were from? It, okay, I actually hear two, two of the early ones. So I hear Italy, Ireland. So Ireland actually, and again, this is not a hard stop. It's not like when I talk about immigration it shuts off from place to place. You see more of an increase of immigration from Ireland actually before Italy. And one of the reasons why is because of the potato famine in the 1840s um, and the continued um, challenge. I mean, the potato famine, even after the, fam the famine, had really significant effects on the population I and mean, infrastructure. So for decades after that, you see an increase in Irish immigration. Um, so Framingham was actually the first local town to welcome a Catholic church. Um, and as as Irish immigrants began immigrating to America in the 1840s, um, they eventually came to worship at St. George's Parish, and they worked in Framingham's bustling factories. Um, so the booming economy and actually the tolerance of Catholicism in Framingham led to another increase in French-Canadian immigration um, shortly after that. So in 1933, um, there was a recount by William Washburn who wrote of his life in the 1870s, quote, there were no Italians or French Canadians living in town. At least I never knew of any. Railroad track hands were mostly Irish and received a dollar a day in wages. So some of the earliest uh, uh, immigrant groups that you see to the area um, were Irish. Um, now, one of the other large groups, or large-ish, I should say, specifically for Framingham who came um, in the 18th 1880s were actually Jewish immigrants. So you see a really big increase in pogroms um, in Eastern Europe at this time period. Again, another story for another day. Um, but you see in 1885, Prussian Jewish businessman Abraham Schumann actually relocated his menswear factory from Boston to Second Street in Framingham. Um, and he and many Jewish immigrants who were uh, worked um, in the fours actually settled in town and they established uh, Framingham's first Jewish community um, in the mid 1880s. Now, I'll go ahead and, and jump ahead, of course, to say the next group of immigrants um, that we see coming are Italian immigrants. And you see them coming um, at the turn of the century, so the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and there are several reasons for that. There was a lot of economic instability. There was political instability um, in Italy at the time period. Um, so Framingham already had sort of an infrastructure with the factories, but the factories were starting to grow. It was going from the straw hat factories into the rubber factories and beyond. Um, and it already had a name as a major manufacturing center. So boots, shoes, rubber, later tires as well. And Italian um, stonemasons were actually some of the most critical part of this immigration. Um, they were even part of, of uh, the group that built um, the, uh, the Minuteman uh, soldier in Buckminster Square. Um, so they were very talented, skilled stonemasons who are coming um, and helping these infrastructure projects. Projects. They helped to build the aqueducts. They helped to build um, uh, major uh, thoroughfares as well. 
So the Italian population both worked in the factories and built the infrastructure of what we see um, in Framingham. And you can really see the changing and the shifts of time um, in immigration by looking at the neighborhoods in Framingham. Um, so we've just started the History Center. We launched the Hikes Through History Tour, um, where we actually go through neighborhoods and talk at, about the change over time. And we recently had uh, a talk about Coburnville, Tripoli um, as a neighborhood. Fascinating history. If you want to look at immigration in Framingham, that is an excellent neighborhood to really do that. Um, so Coburnville itself actually, um, so it was a, budded a place that used to be called Dublin um, because of the Irish immigration in Framingham. Um, and it actually got its name because of a, a company that moved Claflin, Clo um, Cloburn, and, and Co. They actually had a fire in Hopkinton. It was a really devastating fire. I think there was a like a powder of or a case of gunpowder behind a clothing store register, which I think you shouldn't do, probably. Um, but after that fire, they moved their operations to Framingham, which were really well known for being a manufacturing hub. Um, and with that move, you see a huge amount of population coming. And actually, the first tenement housing um, was built on Coburn Street. And that's actually where uh, Coburnville got its name, because the person who built it was N.P. Coburn. Um, so that's actually the, the name that was given to Coburnville. So I wanted to put up this image specifically um, to really talk about how uh, immigration often has this celebratory patriot sort of feel to it. It feels like an upward mobility, like, oh, immigration coming here. It, it's really an exciting uh, movement. But it was an extraordinary challenge for many people, including in Framingham. Um, and so that's a part of the story that we have to keep reminding of ourselves when we talk about Framingham as a place that's welcoming to immigrants. We have to talk about instances where also was not. Um, so what we see here is actually um, the Marini family. They were in South Framingham, we believe, um, in the neighborhood of Coburnville, and this was in 1912. Um, so you see that there are three children. There are ages, um, the ones who are specifically working on the tags, 10, 8, and 6 years old. Um, the person who's visiting this house noted that the children were anemic, um, and they made more or less $10 per day. Um, this tenement housing, um, it was not built um, for the health of the families, um, and it was an extraordinary challenge for people who are living here or immigrating here. Um, there were also uh, significant nativist groups that, that had, again, at this time period, we're thinking of the early 1900s, had uh, come out against immigrants. Um, so the KKK um, certainly had a rise, um, and one of the, the, in researching for this exhibition, one of the, the stories that I came across was that of Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. And I don't know if anyone has, has heard um, about these individuals. Um, so they were Italian immigrants. Um, they were accused of robbery and murder um, in Braintree, Massachusetts in 1920. Um, and it stated that there's no direct evidence actually linking them necessarily um, to the crime itself. Um, but both of the men um, were considered anarchists. Um, so they were considered uh, immigrating these dangerous ideas, um, which is a theme that you start seeing in anti-immigration um, narratives. Um, so at their trial, um, they were found guilty on July 14th, 1921, I believe, um, executed soon, soon after. So this is really the story of sort of an anti-immigration message. And you listen to some of the things that were said about these two individuals. And it was, immigration is ruining America. They're bringing in dangerous ideas. They're destroying the economy. They're taking jobs. It's dangerous. The areas where they are, you can't go in those part of towns. You hear similar rhetoric coming around when, when you talk about immigration um, throughout history. So the Italian community and the Irish community as well, um, they actually proactively built supports um, for immigration in Framingham. So that's something that's really also important to talk about. Um, often we look at the supports provided for immigrants and we overlook the huge communities and the supports that immigrants built for themselves and for the larger community as well. Um, so St. Tarsicius um, was of course established in 1907 by Father Pietro Maschi um, and it supported the whole nation neighborhood. Um, the cemetery was established in 1916. We see the Columbus Club that was established in 1910. Um, and this was an essential point of sharing information. The Columbus Club was a place where you could go speak with other people who spoke Italian and find out what's happening in the community, what's going on. Um, so these were very proactive community supports, the models of which really laid the foundation for future immigration um, in Framingham. 
So I'm going to jump um, forward a fair amount, again, for the, the sake of time, um, and discuss some of the mid-1900s immigration that you see. Um, so one of the biggest waves of immigration that starts to set the tone for the 1960s and beyond um, is, the, is the global migration of Puerto Ricans. Now, it's really important when we talk about Puerto Ricans um, that we don't discuss it in the terms of immigration, but global migration, um, it being part of, the, of America. So when we talk about Puerto Ricans, we refer to it as global migration. Um, Puerto Ricans, where they were fa facing a lagging local economy, um, and many were looking for the opportunity not just to do seasonal work, but to really put down roots um, and stay in the area. So from 1960 to 1980, um, there was a boom in Spanish-speaking populations in Framingham. Again, the foundation really being laid by the Puerto Rican um, community. So as this community grows, you actually see um, supports in Framingham growing alongside it, um, including Spanish-speaking supports, language supports. Um, the Spanish Community Center of South Middlesex opened in 1969, so it was in the former First Presbyterian Church on Hollis Street, um, and it provided a meeting space. It was child care, and very importantly, it was a Spanish language library branch. Um, so this was a place of learning, a place where people could go and, and gain more information. Um, we fast forward a few years, and you actually see in 200, uh, the 275th anniversary of the incorporation of Framingham, there were two weeks of festivities in June 1975. Um, there's a, a, a newspaper scrapbook of it um, that you see up on your screen, and you notice the title is Welcome Strangers. Um, that was actually the, uh, the, the theme of the entire uh, celebration was welcome strangers. So by 1975, Framingham through and through had embraced this idea um, that it was a space that was welcoming to immigrants. So it was a space that was welcoming um, to, to all of those who were looking for a place to establish and grow. Um, I'll take a quick pause here to note that in the 1970s to 1990s, there were huge shifts that took place in Framingham. I don't need, really barely even need to tell the audience what some of those are, but some of them were the closures of giant factories. Um, so the GM plant closed, Denison closed. Um, we see basically the, the Roxbury Carpet Company closed. So you see the closures of some of these very large employers that again um, were places where many immigrants worked at the time. So um, the 1970 to 1990 was a huge shift um, and it really led to depressions in certain areas um, of town, including in downtown Framingham. So um, there was a sort of a curious uh, time period in 1980 where there was a real need um, for new investment, new businesses to take place, and there was a financial crisis um, taking place in Brazil at the same time. So in 1982, um, you see a financial crisis that would actually have reverberations for decades in Brazil. So you start seeing immigration from Brazil. And again, and we're going to talk about it in a second, um, it's very interesting that Framingham was the location of all places, and I have to wonder, all of these, the story that Framingham community really talked about itself and displayed about it's a place to welcome strangers, and there was this infrastructure built around the Puerto Rican community that was built on the Italian community, that was built on the Irish community. All of these things start layering on, so it's a site that really attracted people who were looking for that better life, that sense of safety, that sense of, I can build something here. So you see a really big um, increase in immigration from Brazil starting in um, the 1980s. A very quick side note, this was not the first connection that Framingham had with Brazil. Um, in the 1800s, there was actually a rubber factory, um, Para Rubber. I know many of you probably heard about it as the factory. It was actually named after Para Brazil, um, which was a town, a location in Brazil um, where there was raw rubber um, that was extracted. It was a uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a pretty horrific place. Um, there was no immigration that we have noted. It was definitely a transport of goods rather than people. Um, but the story of Brazil and Framingham does have a hint, a sort of a footnote um, that took place in the 1800s, again, with that, that early rubber and rubber factory story. 
So I'm going to pause here. Oh, excuse me. No, I'm not going to pause here. I'm actually going to note um, very quickly um, that, that the internal story of Welcome Strangers really reached a national level by 1994. So you see here um, President Clinton um, visiting, and I'm not sure how many of you are here when, when this took place. Okay, at some point I'd love to hear your stories about what that was like. From all the pictures and the news articles, it, it seems like it was an extraordinary um, event. So he was here for the signing of the Improving America's Schools Act. Um, he came on October 20th, 1994, and in his speech he said, quote, we wanted to come here to Framingham because this school has a reputation for academic excellence and because it is so diverse, because it's a school that really looks like America. So by 1994, the story of immigration as a part of Framingham's fabric had already reached a national scale, a national level. Um, and let's see, so I wanted to pause here originally, that's what I was going to say, and ask why Framingham? Why do you think that this is the story that's sort of come about um, for us as a community? Yeah. A lot of these groups had footholds here already in other words, there was also a Portuguese group that was here, which mm -hmm. may have caused more Brazilians to come because it was the same language. Um, and I think, again, having a, an established a foothold here was a big incentive for other people to come. Yep, excellent. And people online can hear the responses. Is that right? Absolutely. So having that, even that sense of, okay, there's an infrastructure there. There are people who could speak the language that I speak there. That is, that's a huge component. Absolutely. What else? Well, not to disagree with you, but I don't think it was that unique. I mean, when you look at Lawrence, there's a lot of Brazilians in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. When you look at the factories that were in Lowell and all of the factory towns here, I'm sure Worcester has a story that's something like that. And you go, you go west to Holyoke and some of those cities, and I, I think it was largely the cities. And, and Framingham had probably had a somewhat larger population than the smaller cities, and, and so there was, there, there was housing here, I suspect. There were jobs. And so I think in, in a lot of communities like Framingham, and Framingham was one, but it's certainly not the only one. Absolutely, and that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because it's an interesting thing where you look around and say, okay, which stories or which communities have the narrative that really sort of put it forward and say, okay, we are a place of immigration. And that's something where with Framingham, like there are so many, every single town and city that you mentioned has a rich story of immigration similar to Framingham. And yet Framingham is that one because of that larger population, because of the housing, um, because of a lot of the opportunities that sort of has almost gained a, a, a title um, or a national notoriety for it. So excellent. Yep. Um, and then I realize that I'm getting close to the end of time, so I did want to, um, to bring up the exhibition itself. A few of the other things that I did want to bring up um, is, again, to reiterate underneath the why Framingham um, is the opportunity for work, the big changes. I mean, the major factories that were here really brought in um, those communities as well. There were the language studies. Um, there were service agencies as well. And then there is the history of internal support, so community-based um, supports here that were created by the immigrant groups um, as supporting the immigrant groups um, that, that were a significant part of it. Um, I have not even touched some of the stories of refugees. Um, again, that's something that we're going to talk about in the exhibit as well. Um, but we look at Soviet Jewry, we look at Syrian refugees, we look at Haitian refugees, you know, this very year. Um, and Framingham continues to be involved in the story of refuge and, and immigration itself. So, oh yes. Interesting. Okay, so I heard there's uh, there was a synagogue in the south side of Framingham that burned down in the 1960s. So yeah, I'll have to definitely look that up. I mean, there's so many fascinating stories that that you know tie tie into this directly. So thank you for that. 
So one of the things that I wanted to show you um, today is a little preview of the exhibition that's opening up at the end of January um, in 2024. And it's called Framingham's Collective Journey, Story of, of Immigration 1960 to Present. Um, and this is the first on-site exhibition that really explores um, the recent waves of immigration. Um, we did have a fantastic uh, uh, um, exhibition about Italian immigrants, Italian immigrants, excuse me, called Abondanza. I think some of you might in this um, room might remember it um, but this is really the the first time that we're exploring more recent um, uh, immigration stories here and this is co-curated by Patrick St. Pierre who I think many of you know here um, and he actually designed this lovely artwork um, to really uh, start the discussion on um, immigration itself so one of the things that I did want to point out is you notice we say the word stories. Um, and I think that that's a really essential way to talk about immigration because this is not an exhibit that we could write as a history center. It is very much a community curated exhibition. It's one that is only possible um, through working with our communities today who are sharing their stories, who are sharing their voices and their experiences um, of what it's like. And nearly every culture has a a history of storytelling. It might be through um, written forms, it might be through oral traditions, it might be through song or through dance, um, but almost every community has a way of passing down this narrative or the story over time. Um, so the exhibition itself um, is actually going to be at, at the Edgel Memorial Library, um, but the exhibition itself is really anchored within these stories of oral histories. And I wanted for the first time to show um, everyone here an actual layout of the exhibition. Uh, a disclaimer, some things might shift over time, not to scale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's been a real honor to work with Patrick St. Pierre on this exhibition um, itself as we're, we're creating these community contacts. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the components here. And I do apologize. It's, I think it's a little hard to read on your screen. Um, so I do apologize. Um, but the intro is really talking about why Framingham. What, what led to um, this being a location where nearly one in three over um, double the national out, uh, average of people who are foreign born living in this area. Um, around, the, you see in the bottom of left of the screen something called background. That's an area where we talk all about immigration leading up to 1960. We can't talk about immigration from 1960 to today without talking about everything we discussed uh, this evening. The Irish immigration, Italian immigration as well. Um, so this is an artifact display where we'll talk about immigration leading up to 1960. Um, we'll have a timeline that goes over key turning points um, in, in the immigration history in Framingham. We'll have a section called Fingerprints of Framingham, which really shows how Framingham has been shaped by immigration. The restaurants, the work life, religion, art and culture as well. So that's really showing sort of the shaping of Framingham. Um, and then in the upper right hand corner, um, one of my probably favorite parts of the exhibition um, is a multi-sensory interactive called The Kitchen. Um, so we're recording oral histories with people all around Framingham. And some of the questions that we ask are, what creates a sense of belonging? What makes you feel like you're at home wherever you go? And almost everyone mentions a food. They mention a food, they mention a recipe, they mention a memory of a family member um, in the kitchen somewhere. And so we're actually creating an interactive multi-sensory area where you can actually uh, uh, smell different spices that are commonly used by different cultures. Um, and actually write down a memory that you have. It can be a recipe, it can be a drawing of your connection to that scent, and then add it to a recipe box of Framingham. Um, and of course, what everyone does while they're cooking is listen to to music. Um, so we'll have a playlist where you can actually play music um, from a lot of the different cultures while you're um, experiencing this multi-century um, interactive. Continuing through the exhibition, you have a wall of oral histories where you can actually play clips of people talking about their experiences, their challenges, their joys, their sadness um, in coming to Framingham. Um, and then after that, there's a section where you can actually record your own personal story because that's absolutely essential. Um, one thing I have to mention when we open up this exhibition, it is the first word in a conversation. This is not uh, comprehensive. This is not the, the final word. It couldn't be. This is instead something where we want to start opening up the conversation of immigration, recording more stories, really finding ways, because I tell you what, every single exhibit I've ever opened, there's always someone who comes to the opening event and says, oh, 
let me tell you about my grandmother. And it's this extraordinary story. And I think, where were you six months ago? So this is our way of being able to have those people here um, long after the exhibition opening. And we have a section about resources. Um, so what are the supports? What are the, the, the um, provisions within Framingham that have been both built by and for immigrants um, in Framingham. And then the final part is facing forward. And this is an interactive community discussion board where we can actually have discussions, moderated discussions, about the future of immigration in Framingham um, and what, uh, what questions people have, what solutions we might be able to come up together um, through that. So, I wanted to um, end with, again, it's about five minutes or so, I'd say until the ending, um, with, with just sharing that your story is essential in what we're talking about here um, with collective journeys. Uh, I'm always fascinated, again, about history. It is a shaped story. Um, we as human beings are expert storytellers. We have an almost infinite amount of information that we can choose from. And there are specific events, there are specific themes, there are specific artifacts that we choose to, to save and string together into a narrative of who we are. Framingham as a community um, has chosen with fits and starts, with challenges, unquestionably. Um, we've all seen the anti-immigrant um, protests that have been taking place. Um, Framingham has intentionally, though, as a large part, decided to say, we want to be a place that welcomes strangers. Um, so really hope this exhibition takes the next step in saying, how can we continue to do that? So thank you very much. I'd love to open it for questions. I think a real important um, something that wasn't mentioned was, well, my my dad grew up in East Boston, which a lot of immigrants came in to East Boston, a lot of Italian immigrants. And, and one of the stories he uh, my dad always told was he used to tutor he used to tutor people um, youngsters I think other youngsters as he was growing up in East Boston. So I think that's a something. That you talked to many of <laughs> I sorry. love that story. Absolutely. I mean, and that's one of the interesting stories of immigration. Sometimes people say, well, can I say that I immigrated to Framingham if I first went to New York City or I went to Boston or somewhere else? And that's absolutely part of the story and the narrative um, is also that decision to move from a location like that to Framingham. I mean, that's that's a jump. That's a that's a definite decision. And part of what we want to explore with this exhibit is why Framingham? You know, why did he choose to move to Framingham? But yeah, I love of that, that story of tutoring, and it's that person-to-person -person connection that you often see coming out in stories. Absolutely. Uh, two of the more recent uh, ways that we've welcomed people is the very active uh, Framingham ESL program here <laughs> that has a lot of, ha always has more people that want to be in it than available slots. Uh, and the two-way bilingual program through the Framingham schools, <clears throat> which where kids learn their, from their, they go from their first language to the second language, and they, they learn another language through each subject. Not <clears throat> I think that's had a lot to do with, um, I know in our, our sons went through that program K through 12, and they both ended up speaking, they're still speaking Spanish. So and that's that's a, you know, that's something that most Americans don't do. Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, Jen Grietchi, who I think um, some of you know in the audience, she's actually um, our humanities advisor on this project, and she talks about how the school is a central place, and sometimes it, it was very exclusionary. It was very hard for students who are immigrating, coming into the Framingham school system. And the, the language supports that grew out of there are extraordinary. I think um, the Framingham Adult ESL was established in 1984, I think with 30 students, and now they have over 600 per semester. Um, so language supports absolutely are a critical component of that. All right, thank you so much. And I truly hope you'll be part of this exhibit, even uh, or online, if there are stories you can share. Um, please send us an email, um, contact us, give us a call. We'd love to work with you, because this is really a community-built exhibition. Um, so we're excited to build it with you. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Anna, for being here tonight and getting us excited about this exhibition. Can you give us a, a, a hint of when it might open? Yes, so it will open Sunday, January 28th, 2024. Awesome. So we hope that you all will go to the Framingham History Center and check out this new exhibition. And um, we also hope that you all will join us next week for Dr. David Smales and his final lecture of this series. And then this series will again resume in January of next year. So we hope you'll join us for that as well. Um, thank you so much for being here in the room. Thank you so much for being here tonight. If you know somebody who wasn't able to be here tonight, the program was recorded and will be available on the Framingham Library YouTube page. So send them in that direction and stop by the Framingham History Center.